On July 23rd, 2021, Disney Jr. aired the 43rd episode of the new Muppet Baby series titled Gonzarella, and the internet collectively lost its shit. I didn't want to leave the royal ball, and everyone would have been upset if they knew it was me wearing that princess dress. Maybe they just would have been surprised that you wanted to wear a princess dress. It's different from what they're used to, you know? Everyone, there's something I need to tell you. The princess who came to your ball tonight was me. <laughs> I'm Gonzarella. <gasps> you all expected me to look a certain way. I don't want you to be upset with me, but I don't want to do things just because that's the way they've always been done either. I want to be me. I've seen angry conservatives and gay teenagers talk about the Gonzarella episode, but what I have yet to see is someone analyze this episode through the lens of simply being a Muppets fan. The only goal of my analysis is to decide if Gonzo, being Gonzarella, makes sense with his character. Does it have character integrity, or is it really just 2021 pandering in an attempt to make a character with no queer traits queer? Because obviously, I think queer people deserve a place in children's media, but I also don't support lazy writing and throwing those themes onto pre-existing characters just to get points for being inclusive. So in this video, I am going to be talking about why Gonzo is the best character to introduce these themes into the series. Because as I'll soon prove, this fits Gonzo's character incredibly well. If any Muppet was going to be confirmed queer, it was always going to be Gonzo. And while the Muppets in general have sort of become a part of queer culture, Gonzo is notorious for being the one that queer audiences see themselves represented by. But don't just believe me because I say so and I have a picture of Jim Henson hanging on my wall. Let's actually talk about why Gonzo is the closest thing to a queer icon the Muppets have given us, and why I think Gonzarella is the perfect opportunity to expand upon those themes within the franchise. Gonzo was first introduced in the 1970 television special The Great Santa Claus Switch, directed by John Moffat. John Moffat worked with Jim Henson on multiple Muppet projects. The film aired just one year after the first episode of Sesame Street, which had started rapidly pushing the popularity of puppets on television. The Great Santa Claus Switch was a Christmas special with both puppets and human performers, featuring many puppeteers who would go on to work on The Muppet Show, including Jim Henson, Frank Oz, Jerry Nelson, and Richard Hunt. And it is in this television special that we get our first First introduction to Gonzo, or at least what would later become Gonzo, Snarl the Cigar Box Frackle. He was a minor character serving as one of the henchmen of the film's main villain, Cosmo Scam. Jim Henson has said in interviews that he carved the puppet out of a block of foam in only a few hours, which is quite frankly impressive. Snarl the Cigar Box Frackle would make a few more appearances, mostly as minor or background characters in the early 70s, in shows such as Beautiful Day Monster and one of the original pilots of The Muppet Show, The Muppet Show, Sex and Violence. <laughs> However, it wasn't until the first episode of The Muppet Show, which premiered in September of 1976, that we were introduced to the Gonzo that we all know and love. The notion of Gonzo as a character who performs terrible acts but considers them artistic was derived by Jerry Jewell, who while not head writer at the time, would go on to become The Muppet's head writer for nearly four decades, helping develop many of the most popular characters and scripting five full-length feature films. That being said, if it wasn't for Jack Burns, who was the original head writer and head writer at the time, Gonzo as we know him most likely would have been completely forgotten. In an early meeting, he suggested Gonzo perform these crazy acts like eating a tire to flight of the bumblebee, which for those of you who haven't seen the original Muppet Show, Gonzo did in the first episode. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I will eat this rubber tire to the music of the flight of the bumblebee. <laughs> Jack Burns was also responsible for giving Gonzo his name. It should be noted that his species as a frackle would not carry over to The Muppet Show. Gonzo will be played by Muppeteer Dave Goles. You might know him as the performer behind characters like Beauregard, Dr. Bunsen Honeydew, Zoot, and Boober Frackle, as well as inheriting the role of Waldorf from Jim Henson. Despite his incredibly successful career, Goles had no prior experience in puppeteering or acting. He graduated from Los Angeles Arts College of Design and began work as an industrial designer. It wasn't until Sesame Street started airing in 1969 that he became interested in the craftsmanship of puppets. Quote, I had been 
been a Muppet fan for many years, but now I started getting fascinated with the design process that went into what I was seeing on the screen. Who were these people who created the puppets, costumes, and performances that were so evocative? I got very curious. Goals met Frank Oz at a puppetry convention in 1972, showed his portfolio to Jim Henson a few months later, was hired in 1973, and was offered a full-time position in the fall of 1974. He actually started working as a puppet builder and designer, only performing occasionally. He built quite a few characters, the most popular of which being three members of the Electric Mayhem. Floyd Pepper, Animal, and Zoot. Zoot actually ended up becoming his first major role. In 1976, Goals joined the rest of the Henson team and flew to London to begin work on The Muppet Show. In addition to reprising his role as Zoot and playing background roles, Goals was promoted to principal Muppet performer with the starring role of Gonzo. At the time, he was still working in The Muppet Studios, but eventually he transferred to just being a performer performer when the workload got too much. Goals is an incredibly talented performer and puppeteer, and he still plays Gonzo to this day. As someone who loves puppets and loves puppeteering as an art form, I really look up to Goals. He does amazing work, and he has a very clear understanding of these characters and why they're so important to so many people. In an interview from February of 2021, Goals talks about the importance of The Muppet Show being available for streaming. This was around the same time that Disney Plus put The Muppet Show on its services. Quote, the the other reason that is at the top of my mind is that it's really about inclusion. It's this group of sort of misfit characters who find that they can operate together and they can perform in this show, and it sort of creates a home for them. And then, of course, we find that we really enjoy all these aspects of these misfits. I think the world right now really needs more tolerance. We need more celebration of the differences between us and the diversity. That's what enriches life. We just enrich each other in so many ways. And I'm excited about The Muppet Show being up there and showing this group doing that. But today, Today, we're talking about Gonzo, so let's talk a little bit more about him. One of the biggest queer aspects of Gonzo's character is the fact that no one quite knows how to define him. He floats around in space. His identity is never defined, never stated with certainty. He never fits into any boxes both within and outside the Muppet universe. In a world where frogs can talk, pigs can sing, and bears can tell unbearable jokes. Gonzo's identity remains a mystery, and that is where the basis of a queer reading of his character begins to form. From the very beginning, Gonzo's species has been kept a mystery, and he's been called all sorts of things over the years. He's called a weirdo, a whatever, he's said to look a little like a turkey but not much. Thing, whatever Gonzo is, he's a little like a turkey. Mm, yeah, a little like a turkey, but not much. No, I guess not the ugly, disgusting little blue creature who catches cannonballs. In Muppets Wizard of Oz, he's called the Ten Thing instead of the Ten Man. And at one point when asked what he was, he responded with the iconic, I'm an artist. In the late 90s, when asked what Gonzo was, Goals responded with, quote, nobody knows except his parents, and they're not talking. It was always one of those taboo subjects around the dinner table. In the 1981 film, The Great Muppet Caper, Gonzo was shipped off to England in a crate labeled whatever, and the ambiguity of his identity became more formal. Gonzo was whatever. His species and his identity would remain undefined because they didn't need defining. Queer audiences latched on to the character without a label. The one who wasn't bothered by being undefined and the one who had a support system who loved him no matter what he was or wasn't. Growing up queer often means growing up without the language to describe how you feel. Many LGBTQ plus people make it to adulthood before ever even being exposed to the community and widespread education on different terms and labels is still fairly new. Labels can be a great thing that help lots of people feel incredibly seen and validated, but they can also be confusing and stressful for people who don't know how to define themselves, or can't find a label that accurately describes the complexities of their identity and their lived experiences. It is also often implied within the community that the end goal should always be to find the perfect label and to come out. Finding the perfect label is not the end-all be-all to being queer, and not having an exact label doesn't make you any less valid as a member of the community, and it's okay to not feel the desire to find the most micro-descriptive, perfect label. <laughs> Queer people are put under this immense pressure to be able to describe themselves and their identity when we often don't have the words, and lack of words is often used to belittle or invalidate people, even from members of our own community. <laughs> and then there's Gonzo, the character without a label, the one who is happily and confidently unclassified. Gonzo not only exists in an undefinable space, but he's proud to be a 
whatever. And his fellow Muppets love and support him, even if they don't fully understand everything about him. This is huge for queer people searching for pieces of themselves in the media that they consume. In 1986, during the peak of the original Muppet Baby show, a book was published titled What's a Gonzo? The book follows Gonzo as he tries to figure out what he is. The other Muppets make guesses and eventually he's pulled through a mirror into a world surrounded by creatures just like him. The only problem is, none of them know what they are either. At the very end of the book, when Gonzo asks what he is for the last time, he is told, you are Gonzo. You might not know what you are, but you know who you are. In all forms of Muppet media, from the Muppet show to the Muppet movie to Muppet babies, Gonzo has been the one to teach us that being undefined is okay. That we are who we are, and it's okay to not always know. The only attempt to fully understand Gonzo's identity was the 1999 feature film Muppets from Space, which claimed that Gonzo was actually an alien from another world. That being said, most people don't consider this film to be part of Muppets canon. Members of the creative team have even encouraged viewers not to take this film too seriously, and instead to view it as the Muppets playing themselves in a fictional story. Similar to how, even though they use their real names, Muppets Take Manhattan is a fictional story within the Muppets universe. The Jim Henson Company did try to classify Gonzo as an alien for a while, but it just didn't stick, and his official label returned to the classic whatever. That being said, there are still plenty of queer themes within Muppets from Space that are often overlooked. <laughs> In the beginning, Gonzo has a nightmare where he's turned away from Noah's Ark, not just because they don't know what he is, but because he's the only of his kind, and he doesn't have a binary opposite to go with him. Later in the film, he sits with Kermit and he discusses his struggles with his identity. Well, it's just that I'm sick and tired of being a one-of-a-kind freak, that's all. Gonzo, you are not a one-of-a-kind freak. Well, you're a, uh... Uh... A whatever? Well, yeah. Yeah, you see? You see what I mean? I mean, I don't even know where I came from or who I am. You know what you are, Gonzo? What? Distinct. Gonzo feels isolated and alone because he knows he doesn't fit into the labels that are available to him. And there's no question about it. I particularly like this scene because it shows how caring and accepting the other Muppets are when it comes to Gonzo. He feels safe enough to talk to Kermit about this huge struggle, distinct as a compliment. Later in the film, after Gonzo realizes he might be an alien, he says, quote, Kermit, I realize that it may be hard for you to accept me as an alien, but I didn't choose to be one. Well, I've always had alien tendencies. This just makes sense to me. Me. How many queer people have said something similar to that during their coming out experiences? Because I know I have. Even the movie that tries to fix the biggest piece of evidence towards a queer reading of Gonzo is littered with pieces of the queer experience. His relationship with his identity, or lack thereof, is what so many queer audiences are able to see themselves represented by. So all of this is great and fine and dandy, but like, mm, isn't it just a metaphor? I get that struggling with identity is a big part of the queer experience, but species? It's a lot different than gender identity and sexuality, right? Well, yeah. Except when it comes to Gonzo, the fluidity of his identity has included sexuality and gender since the very beginning. Or at the very least, it is heavily implied that it does. Gonzo has flirted with both men and women on The Muppet Show, my favorite of which being the Gene Kelly episode. Miss Piggy, you've got to change for pigs in space. Oh, 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 Gene, I'm so sorry. I'm, I must go talk. Well, we haven't finished our song. That's okay. You can sing it to me. What's it called? You, you, you wonderful you. Perfect. I, I don't think it'll be the same. Gonzo sings a love song with Gene Kelly, and while Gene briefly acknowledges that he thinks it's a little weird at first, Gonzo never does. This is normal for Gonzo, and he has no reason to overthink it, and eventually, they sing the rest of the song together, and all is well. And then we have gender identity. In 1984, brothers Brad and Guy Gilchrist created the comic strip Jim Henson's Muppets, which was printed worldwide in over 660 newspapers from 1981 to 1986. 
One of their comic strips being this. Gonzo walks right past the women's and men's restroom, choosing instead to enter a restroom labeled whatever. This is a piece of officially licensed Muppet material that shows that the fluidity of Gonzo's identity includes gender. And before anyone tells me that Gonzo is a Muppet and therefore things work differently and it doesn't count or whatever, let me pleasantly remind you that plenty of other Muppets participate in the gender binary. Miss Piggy is incredibly proud to be a woman, Kermit the Frog is a man, and Gonzo is a whatever. Not to mention that this comic strip was positively received by the public. The Muppet artwork was permanently enshrined in the Smithsonian Institute. Guy's Muppet artwork was also chosen to be part of the touring Art of the Muppets exhibit and has appeared in museums worldwide. So at the very least, Gonzo being a whatever has included his gender identity since the mid 80s. And what about cross-dressing? I mean, people getting upset about Gonzo wearing a dress in the Gonzarella episode is the whole reason that I spent two months writing this video. But guess what? Gonzo cross-dressed before, multiple times, and he's been doing it as early as the first season of The Muppet Show in 1976. And not only that, but Gonzo also cross-dressed in the original 2D animated Muppet Baby series from the 80s. So not only has Gonzo cross-dressed in The Muppet Show, but he's cross-dressed in Muppet Babies before. So not only has a queer interpretation of Gonzo existed since his character was first introduced, but Gonzo's been wearing women's clothing for nearly 50 years. Gonzo really be out here being the fashion icon of The Muppet Show. Don't tell Miss Piggy, I fear her. This of course isn't to erase the very distinct difference between gender identity and gender expression, but with Gonzo's identity as a whatever and his gender non-conforming fashion choices, it is too easy to read his character through a queer lens. It's safe to say that he can at least be interpreted as non-binary. I use non-binary as an umbrella term because the whole point is that he doesn't have an exact label, but you get what I mean. But it's honestly not that hard to argue that he's canonically non-binary, even if that wasn't the original intention of his character. Because no, I don't think Jim Henson sat down with his team of writers and said, let's put some non-binary representation into the Muppet Show. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't even know what non-binary was or what it meant. Like I said before, widespread education on different gender identities is still fairly new, and it is entirely possible that no one on the Muppets writing team at the time knew what non-binary was or knew that gender non-conforming identities existed. But that being said, just because they didn't have the language to outright say he's non-binary doesn't mean that that is essentially what he is. I mean, if you Google what gender is Gonzo, the response you get is whatever. There is no gender attached to Gonzo except for the gender that everybody just assumes that he is. So yeah, Gonzo could very well be a non-binary character who just uses he, him pronouns because non-binary people who use he, him pronouns exist. After the Gonzarello episode aired, Gonzo, or whoever runs the official Gonzo Twitter page, tweeted this. Whoever or whatever you want to be is okay by me. Personally, I prefer to be whatever. When the hate for the Gonzarella episode reached its peak, he tweeted this. I've never followed fashion rules too closely. In fact, I'd prefer to make my own. For instance, in this picture, I'm wearing mittens as socks and part of a shower curtain as a tie. Cause really, why are people upset about what Gonzo wears? He's Gonzo. Even if he wasn't a very heavily queer coded character, Gonzo's fashion sense has always been wild to say the least. So even if we ignore all the queer themes, Gonzarella would still fit Gonzo because he's always been the character to wear clothes that are kind of out there. So in conclusion, no, Gonzarella is not 2021 pandering. Gonzarella is a faithful extension and exploration of aspects of a character that have been around since the very beginning. It is the acknowledgement of themes that have always been central to his character. Not to mention, it's just a charming episode. Gotta love me a dress with pockets, am I right? Showing that just because things have always been done a certain way doesn't mean that that's the right way to do them. And embracing our differences can make the world a whole lot better for everyone. From comic strips to crates labeled whatever to duets with Gene Kelly, Gonzo's identity has always been fluid. And the Gonzarella episode is not the first time he's rocked a dress. Gonzo was the perfect character to introduce these themes with. And it's my hope that the messages that were taught in the Gonzarella episode will help some queer kids out there feel a little less alone. Gonzo has already 
already become the character that we see ourselves in. And it makes me so incredibly happy that the next generation gets to grow up with such intentional and thoughtful stories about the queer community. And in the words of the great Gonzo himself, trust me, you are not alone. Each and every one of us is one of a kind. Even if your kind is hard to define, that's okay. Thank you so, so much for watching. This video has taken me literal months to make, so I am very excited to finally share it with you. If you would like to learn a little bit more about Gonzo and the Muppets and how they relate to queerness, I have a few video recommendations for you. If you'd like to learn a little bit about the trans panic phenomenon and how that kind of ties into the Gonzarella episode, you can check out this amazing video by Dream Sounds. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about one of the queer artists behind the Muppet Show, Richard Hunt, you can watch this incredible video. I will leave links to both of them down in the description box down below. And of course, if you would like to support my channel and more future video essays, it would be greatly appreciated if you could like, comment, and subscribe and show your support to my channel. I have quite a few video essays that are in the works. There tend to be pretty get big gaps between that type of content just because they take me so long to make, but I like to hope that the time pays off. Anyway, thank you so, so, so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you in next week's video. Bye!